Pamela Stevenson Connolly, a great pleasure to have you back on One Plus oh, One. Thank you. Lovely to see you again. I've been watching some of the episodes of your program, Shrink Wrap, uh -huh. and one in particular with Joan Rivers. And she basically sat down and said that you were unlucky because you had her in a pretty good mood. And this only happened, I think, a day or two in, in seven to ten years. Are you in a good mood at the moment? <laughs> I'm not bad. <laughs> I'm working pretty hard with my show, Brazooka, which is, um, you know, I'm Brazilian wrangling, which is uh, never easy with my limited Portuguese. The best thing is being in Australia, because um, I haven't been here for about a year, and uh, it looks like I might get to spend Christmas here. Um, my husband uh, promised me years and years and years ago that we could have one hot Christmas and one cold Christmas. So the idea was Scotland, Australia, consecutive years. No, never happened. <laughs> the, men lie about this stuff. They, you know, they do it to get you to say yes and, um, and then they, they don't follow through. How did the idea to get involved in Brazooka come up? Because you told me last time that when you were young, ballet, which I think you took after you had polio, was one of the greatest joys of your life. It's, it's true. Uh, I discovered something through dance that I, I probably wouldn't have discovered any other way. Um, I came from a very academic family where what goes on between your ears is more important than anything else. And of course, I would never uh, disagree that, you know, cerebral activity and, and what we do with our brains isn't very, very important. But I also learned very early on that the visceral sensations of the body, the connecting your mind and your body, um, the delicious way that, you know, when you stretch, you get those wonderful good feelings. Um, when you exercise and get your heart rate up, how, how good that makes you feel. As a mature woman, I had to find a way to continue to dance that was a little bit above kind of, you know, awful mum dancing at the Christmas party kind of thing. So there's a big social dance scene, of course, all around the world. And I looked around. I went to Buenos Aires and I studied tango, Argentine tango, which I loved. Um, I love the dance, I love the connectedness, I love the feelings I got from that, that dance, but I didn't love the social situation. What do you mean? Well, they have these dance parties called milongas, and in Buenos Aires, and actually they repeat this all over the world, which I don't understand because there's no need for it. But in Buenos Aires, the, the rules of the milonga are that women are supposed to go and sit there and wait for a man to come and ask them to dance. <laughs> That's very I'm not, not that sort of girl. And I could never understand this. It was like, well, why? Why can't I just walk up and say, how about it? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you know, Argentine men don't, don't really like that. Um, and what you, the women are supposed to do, it's worse. The women are supposed to not just wait, but they're supposed to, if they think they might like to dance with the guy, they're supposed to give him a special kind of look. I'll try to do it. It's like, let's say you're the guy who's <laughs> like, I don't know. The problem is I could never do it. I could never figure it out. And then he is in the understanding that if he invited me to dance, I wouldn't refuse him. I mean, God forbid he should risk rejection. <laughs> so <laughs> I would look like this and, and then, you know, I discovered that that didn't mean he would come over and say, would you like to dance? No, <laughs> no, <laughs> because there might be a second possibility for rejection. So <laughs> what they did <laughs> was they would jerk their heads in the direction of the dance floor. <laughs> <laughs> and you were supposed to meet them on the dance floor. It's like, I'm not going to hang around this. This is awful. Anyway, finally, here I was. I got invited by a women's magazine, Women and Home, invited me to go to, um, to uh, Brazil and write about Brazilian dance. And I got to Brazil and I was exhausted um, and I probably wasn't in the right frame of mind to be, to be there. And I arrived on New Year's Eve and it was boiling hot, it was noisy, they didn't have my reservation at the hotel, I mean everything went wrong. And finally I contacted um, somebody that I'd met who'd given me a lesson in London, a man called Bras dos Santos. And I said, listen, 
I'm here, I'm writing this story, I'd like to interview you and your family about Brazilian dance, because I knew his brother was very uh, big in the dance field, um, but um, actually I've got a few problems, <laughs> could you help, and I don't speak Portuguese. He said, all right, uh, look, just get yourself settled in. Um, there's a few of us going to meet for New Year's Eve. I'll meet you on the beach, but you have to wear white. So I went down there, and all of a sudden, my life changed. From 11.30 that New Year's Eve until 12.30 that New Year's Eve, I had this epiphany of looking around this beach in Brazil where all these, I mean, I want to say they were beautiful people, but it wasn't just about their beauty. It was their sort of physical grace. They all had flowers and maybe a little something to drink, and they were all dressed in white, and the moon was out, and the sea was there, and just before midnight, they all counted down from seven, threw the flowers into the sea, and jumped in the sea to, um, to pay respects to Yemenja, the queen of the sea. And then they came out of the water and started dancing on the beach in the, in the moonlight. And I just thought it was amazing and that we should, everyone should see it, because at this point, you know, we seen many dancers on TV and on the stage and we really hadn't seen dancers that um, I mean most of them we'd seen a million times we, we, we were ready for something new a moment ago you were speaking about how nice it was to be back in Australia and you might actually get a hot Christmas finally I wonder in your adult years coming back here I mean you weren't particularly happy as a child living here has it kind of come full circle for you well, you know, I can look back to my childhood years and, and very much appreciate the great things that I enjoyed growing up in Sydney. Um, you know, I've got to that point, and certainly a lot of those things are the, the, just the physical beauty of, of, of being in Australia, the, uh, the, the warmth, of not just of the climate, but of the people generally, um, the being able to be in nature, um, you know, just, I suppose, the freedom, I did have um, a certain amount of, of freedom. I, I, I fought for a lot of it, I, I stole a lot of it, but, but you know, I was able to be the architect of my life up to a point, especially when I was a teenager. I was quite a rebellious teenager, and, and I think that was a good thing. And one thing I wanted to ask you last time, which I didn't, you talked about your parents being quite remote scientists, and you never got really enough encouragement and love and physical warmth, I suppose. Is that something you ever again came full circle with your parents? Were you ever able to sit down and discuss that with them? No, my parents passed away before we ever got to that point and, um, and I'm not sure that it would ever have been possible really um, because they were who they were. I mean, they were people who didn't have, um, really didn't have much ability to be too warm or connected. Um, but I suppose that it must be pretty obvious that that visceral closeness that I appreciate about dance is and, and crave about dance is related to my sense of um, having been denied that as a child. As I mentioned to you before, I had been enjoying some of your episodes of, of shrink wrap and particularly I was looking at the ones with Robin Williams, the actor, and Joan Rivers, who both passed away this year. And it was incredible watching the vulnerability in both of them in a way I had never seen when I saw them as performers. Did that strike you at the time, the, the vulnerable nature of both of their personalities? Joan was a surprise. I didn't really want to interview Joan. Um, really? No, because I, you know, I really admire Joan as, as a comedian. I mean, she's incredible and I'd seen her seen her live, I'd seen her do a lot of things over the years, and actually I thought she was so defended that she would just do shtick and she'd make me laugh and we'd never, we'd never get anywhere, right? that she would not allow me to, to delve or, you know, what I asked of people is to get beyond the official story and, and, and actually she opened herself up and, and allowed, allowed me to talk about things that, um, that were, you know, in a very surprising manner, things she hadn't talked about before. I, I thought we might get on to her husband's death. Of course, sadly, her husband took his own life. Um, but actually, that wasn't what we focused on. We focused more um, on the death of her, her therapist. 
and um, I thought she was amazing. I mean, I just uh, really appreciated her bravery to open herself up that way. Robin, um, it was shocking to hear some of the things that he talked to me about um, that, that time. What particularly shocked you? I mean, I listened to the story of him as a small child playing in an attic by himself. What an image. What, a, what an image. And, you know, the sort of, you know, first of all, you know, one can only extrapolate, you know, the, the, the power of the brain. I mean, to go from, from how the imagination, how his imagination must have had to develop. Uh, and did so, so so naturally and, and in such an extraordinary way. And the relationship between that and who he was as a comedian, you know, surely one of the, the best we've ever seen, um, ever. And um, the way that he, he riffed in such a safety net less fashion, like my husband, um, creating characters from nowhere. Well, you now, you know, after, after Shrink Rap, I could see the relationship. I could see how that had come from being forced to create his own universe, peopled with extraordinary characters from his own imagination um, in this dark attic while his family had their, their social events downstairs and he was lost and forgotten. Really, really poignant, really sad, but also extraordinary. And, and I suppose in a way uplifting to think that that's what the mind can do, you know, out of, out of that kind of child, childhood darkness can come that kind of power and creativity, really incredible. Power and creativity, but also I was reflecting on the meaning of happiness, which particularly in Joan Rivers' case seemed to have eluded her. And I wonder, you've had the opportunity and you did this for your doctoral thesis, I think, um, on fame and celebrity. Have you thought in your life that you've understood more about why we try to pursue happiness? Not so much happiness, but I think we, as a, as a race, get confused. Probably it's cultural. We get confused. We think that happiness and fame and success are the same things. And, and I think that's a message that, it's, it's a lie actually, that we get taught really early on. Uh, we were all encouraged to stick our heads above the parapet and, um, and, and actually, you know, fame is such a, a hollow victory. And I perceive it as a trauma. And that was certainly um, the case for everybody I spoke to um, on Shrek Fame is a trauma? Mm -hmm. Yes. Fame is always experienced by the psyche as traumatic um, because uh, there's, tremendous, there's tremendous loss involved, a loss of so many things, loss of who you perceived yourself to be. Every single relationship in your life changes as a result of coming to public attention. The projections of, of the public, the expectations, including the expectation that you will not behave well. There's an expectation that you can behave any way you darn well please, and that's kind of supported, which means that a lot of people get into a lot of trouble because they buy into that and, you know, start breaking rules that they shouldn't really be breaking. What about the pursuit of fame? I mean, that seems to have magnified 20-fold, I suppose, since the time you first started practicing psychology. It seems now that every sort of reality cooking show or, or show full stop is all about younger people in particular seeing that as an easy road to not just fame but success. That in itself I don't think is such a bad thing and of course it's also borne out in social media because suddenly everybody's a star on their own Facebook page but or created themselves that's the difference you create your own um, new personality. Um, it's, it's that people think that something else will go along with that that once you come to public attention, once you achieve something very publicly, that that will be the end of all your problems, that you will get as much love as you ever wanted, you will be admired as much, as much sex, you know, you'll have, you'll have all these things, as much money. It, it's as though that is the equivalent of happiness. It solves all your problems, and of course it's just the beginning of your problems. And the gap between who you begin to perceive yourself to be in the eyes of others and who you really feel you are inside, who you know you are inside, becomes wider and wider. The wider that gap becomes, 
the more difficult and the more trouble you might get into. It's like, well, if they really knew who I was, if they really knew what I looked like without makeup, if they really knew <laughs> um, that I'm not that funny, if they really knew um, how I behaved on certain occasions, you know, they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't be saying all those incredible things about me. It's very hard. We'll come to the bit about makeup in a little while. <laughs> But still on the subject of fame, and in the last 12 months, you and your family, your husband, Billy Connolly, had some initially quite troubling news with diagnoses of prostate cancer and Parkinson's. Has it been difficult to, I suppose, move through what he is going through, given that you are a well-known, a famous couple? Forget the fame. It's hard to go through that with any family. I mean, it's, you know, I, I have to sort of set aside the fame side of it and say, well, you know, for anybody, I mean, anybody who might be watching this who's had bad news from the doctor, you know, or had a loved one have bad news from the doctor, that's always hard. And you have to, well, how are we going to deal with this? Who are we going to tell? Are we going to keep this a secret or are we going to look for support among people? And these are always decisions that people have to make. Well, you know, what's going to happen? You know, are you likely to, you know, survive this? I mean, all these, these very difficult questions. So, of course, it was particularly difficult. Billy went through a lot and uh, fortunately, you know, he's, he's doing pretty well. And Actually, it wasn't the, the prostate cancer um, or the fact that he has very low-level Parkinson's. It's really not something that's advancing fast. Or, um, but, but actually, you know, Billy was having trouble with his hearing. Um, I mean, that was really the hardest thing because, because, you know, when people start losing their hearing, they become so, you know, they start... Isolated. With, isolated. And... You know, Billy was like all those people who've been around rock and roll forever. You know, they've been sitting on speakers since the days of Elton John in the early days or whatever. And they don't realize, I mean, all those old rockers, they're all get it going deaf. And, and they're too proud, you know, to get a hearing aid half the time. And, you know, I'm always running into, you know, friends who are like that and say, dude, you can't hear a word I'm saying. Get yourself some treatment. <laughs> And Billy was the same. I tried for 10 years to get him to get, get a hearing aid. 10 years? Seriously. And, and, and finally, he was having trouble hearing the audience. And so that was really the thing that got, got me in a position so I could finally say, get yourself to the doctor. Because um, people thought that he was forgetting his lines and things. He wasn't. We had his memory tested. He's got a better memory than I have. It was just that at that time, he didn't have any help for his hearing and he, he couldn't hear the feedback. And of course, a comedian has to uh, get immediate feedback. As soon as he got some help for his hearing, it was like night and day. He, he became better on stage than he's been for years and years and years. Amazing. I mean, yes, he went through um, all the sort of mortality awareness and the fears, for, especially for someone who'd been healthy his entire life. Um, uh, but, you know, he's very strong. He went through it. He, he had the operations. He had a bit of a complication. He came out the other side. He sort of lives with Parkinson's. Um, we were told that he'd probably had it for 10 years too. So, um, you know, it's very slowly advancing. So while the news at the time, which was about a year ago, was fairly probably surprising, possibly even shocking, it's, it's something else to be managed in your lives. It's not a it's not a sentence of any kind. Well, no. I mean, you know, many, there are many survivors of prostate cancer and all different kinds of cancer. And without taking away the profundity, you know, it's, it's a very difficult thing for anybody to deal with. But, you know, for many people, it, it, it's probably quite good to, to view it as a chemical in, inconvenience, you know. Of course, I'd worked uh, a lot in my practice as, as a psychologist with uh, survivors and people who um, both did and did not survive it. And so, you know, I was already aware of how much it can affect relationships, of how hard it is for people to begin to face their mortality in a very real way, um, of how hard it is to go through chemo, re radiation, and, and so on, uh, which Billy did not go through, by the way. He was fortunate not to have to do that. But, um, you know, I. 
thank God, it was, it, was, it was good that I already had some understanding of what that path is like. It, I'm not going to say it made it any easier because when it happens to you personally or to somebody you love, it's, 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 just, it's just as hard, but at least I had some information. A few years ago on this program, you said there's no way I'm ever going to settle gently and gracefully into my final decades. <laughs> what exactly did you mean by that? Ah, that's pretty clear. <laughs> I just, you know, I just, I think that uh, there's sort of a lot of crap talked about how we should behave, you know, as we, as we get older, or how we should look or how we should be. And I think everybody's different. I mean, I think people need to feel that they can choose um, how they want to age, whether they, you know, what they want to do about their bodies, their, their looks, their minds, um, their families. I mean, all of those things. I, mean, I just feel people have choices and we shouldn't be judgmental about what people choose. You know, if I choose to have unfashionably long hair for my age, um, well, that's really because I do this wonderful Brazilian dance and, and need to have hair to flick around. And um, I haven't been shy about letting people know that um, I've had plastic surgery and, and that I, I, I will be very happy if anyone ever, ever cares to uh, Photoshop me. <laughs> it's not, oh yeah, you can Photoshop me. No, it's not, please. <laughs> if you don't make me look good, I will find you. I will hurt you. <laughs> Is it frustrating, though, that in this day and age, you, you have to be asked those questions and you have to justify why you still want to be a babe and you have to come clean on stuff like Botox and yeah, cosmetics? Yeah, I think men don't really get asked these questions, they do don't. they? They <laughs> don't. Um, whereas there's lots of men, I, you know, there are men in the public eye, for example, I spend a lot of time in California. and. You know, and, they, and it, to me and to them, it was a smart business decision for them to, you know, maintain their, their youthful looks. Um, I've actually been impressed. Um, I don't know, I mean, maybe you'll shoot me down and say, well, we don't have enough. But I've been impressed at the number of women of a certain age, and even that expression is offensive, of course, um, on television compared to what I see in, in certain other countries. Are you talking about me? I'm not talking about <laughs> you. No, you're a babe. <laughs> I, it, babe, absolutely not talking about you. But it's pretty annoying when you constantly see these pictures of Helen Mirren as the kind of the way to age, as if, you know, we've all got it within us to have those cheekbones and that figure <laughs> and everything by the time we're in our late 60s or early 70s. Do you think that's unfair? Well, I, but the, the thing is that it's, it's, we're only going to take that in as the... As the, um, as the model, if we want to. You know, if we don't care about that stuff, you know, it, 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 this, is, this is about choices. Women have choices. I do remember um, being asked questions very early, very early on about, you know, how, how would I age, you know, and, and being, probably being just as, um, as pretentious as, as, as many young women are about the whole thing and saying, well, you know, I think the, the idea is to age gracefully. No, rubbish, you turned 40, let's see. <laughs> Especially if you've got to be on TV. <laughs> Bring it on. It's difficult, isn't it? Because the reality is that, that it's hard for women anyway. It's, it's hard for women anyway. And, and I think that, you know, many of us feel um, that, that there is a necessity to keep youthful looks as long as possible, to give us a better chance at longevity in our work. That's a sad situation. That doesn't happen to be my situation because I'm not really in show business. I'm a psychologist. It doesn't matter how I look. This is for me. <laughs> you once described yourself as a toothy, short-waisted, pear-shaped munchkin with an unfortunate facial profile. <laughs> How do you see yourself today? Well, that's, that's, that's definitely how I saw myself when I, was, when I was young, when I was very young, I did. I, I look back at, um, at how I was, say when I was doing Not the Nine O'Clock News, and I go, 
You were such a babe, Pamela. Why didn't you just love it? Why didn't you just appreciate it? But I was, you know, I was, I always had such a, an incredible work ethic. I was always working so hard. I was always so frightened looking over my shoulder. Was there somebody coming up who'd be better, you know, blah, blah. You know, I never allowed myself to relax and enjoy it. And, you know, and I, and I never thought I was, you know, good enough for, um, for anything. So, you know, I always had that, that energy. Maybe that helped me be successful, that, that fear and that drive. I've always been incredibly driven. Now, I'm learning to be much, much more relaxed about myself, and, and the dancing helps. Um, I'm learning to, you know, take, take time. I've become a scuba diver. I love diving. I love, you know, swimming. I'm, I'm doing things that give me more, um, you know, satisfaction. It's not just satisfaction, it's relaxation, I suppose, you know, just letting me have time off from this. Because I've got a very, very active mind, and, you know, I tend to do five things at once. And so I've had to learn that that's not always the best way to, to live my life. It's, it's, a, it's a route to success, and I've been successful in a number of careers, but it doesn't always sort of, <laughs> you know, um, make you happy. Pamela Stevenson Connolly, thank you so much for speaking with me on One Plus One. Thank you, and you really are a babe. <laughs> <laughs>